Hey, everybody. In today's episode, it's myself and Benjamin B. We are covering a topic that has been brought up for discussion inside of our support group. It's called the Sobriety Network on Facebook. And basically what we're talking about is when somebody is capable of getting sober, do they have to actually want to get sober in order to get sober? And uh, it's a few couple interesting opinions that we hold on this. And we also discuss a study that I recently found that is kind of a rather silly study, but it jogged up some pretty good conversation uh, between myself and Ben. So we cover that and more. Enjoy the show. Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we've got Benjamin B. What's happening, everyone? First things first, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one that you choose to use, and thank you for watching on YouTube. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us, info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com, and ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message, right, Ben? Yes, sir. Listen to this, Ben. Shrinking a pint can reduce beer sales by almost 10%. Shrinking a what? pint like a pint of beer shrinking a pint what does that mean so like drink less than a pint first thing is talk into the microphone you need to adjust your mic is it better yeah it's pretty interesting reducing the serving size of beer lager and cider reduces the volume of those drinks consumed in pubs bars and restaurants and could be a useful Alcohol control measure, according to a new study. Researchers found that over a short intervention period, venues that removed the pint and offered two thirds pints and set instead said 10% less beer by volume, sold 10% less beer by volume compared with when pints were available. Yeah, maybe for the normal person, not for the alcoholic. This is nonsense. What kind of study is this? I know. Because do you remember uh, the nickel nickel drafts? Remember that? You'd go to a bar and they'd have a keg and they'd give you this really tiny cup. Oh, for sure. What were they, like eight ounces? Or Not seven? even. Six I think ounces? Six ounces, yeah. And you give them a nickel and they fill it up. But you just drink more of them. Well, that's when, when I was in car sales, there was a... a bar restaurant right across the street that was called bingos and they had uh quarter quarter drafts and 10 cent wings or vice versa maybe it was 10 yeah. cent drafts oh. and 25 cent wings yeah, i right. think that's what it was and yeah they would legit like those i don't even think they're not eight ounces that yeah. they may have been six and so i would legit go in there with like you know, a roll of quarters or two rolls of quarters and just, you know, do them like shots really. So, but the reason that I thought this was funny was because this is, this is like some of these studies are, and this was September. So this was just a month, two months ago. The funny thing is, is that researchers found that over a short intervention period, venues that removed the pint and offered two-thirds pints instead sold 10% less beer by volume compared with when pints were available, full pints. Well, no shit. If you put less beer in a cup, you're going to sell less of that beer. What is a two thirds pint? I know, like, dude, I was a bartender forever. Well, how does somebody order that? Could I get a two thirds pint? Well, I or think a ten ounce mug. It would be a ten ounce mug. Well, I think it's like, you know, when you order a mixed drink or something, depending yeah. on the bartender, it's either going to be really good or really shitty. Well, what's good and what's shit? You mean really strong, really or strong, really weak? Yeah, or really weak. <laughs> You know, you always wanted the bartender that had the heavy hand. Yep. You know, that like, I always laughed at the, when they had the, uh, the jigger. Is that what they're called? Dude, yeah. I had to, I had to use one of those at one of the places I worked. And they would like pour it in the jigger, but then dump the jigger in and keep pouring. You know, that was my type That's of That's what I did too. But the other thing, I, you know how many times I got written up for not using that thing, dude? <laughs> uh. Well, And I never wanted the bartender that actually measured. I never tipped them, for sure. Like, if you're using that stupid thing, 
Oh, when I was, if you didn't tip me, I'd fight you. Yeah, well, you were a cokehead. I was nuts. I got so, some stories about that. Who? But it's interesting what you said because that's exactly where my head went. You know, it's it's funny that people try and mitigate or they use these methods. It's like the story in the big book, the guy that poured whiskey. whiskey in his milk. Yeah. They'll do anything to try and tamper down or put a Band-Aid on, or whatever. And this is a good example. Well, we'll ju- we just won't give you as much beer. Well, here's the other thing. They're, they're trying to reduce the consumption of alcohol for people that probably don't need it reduced. For instance, my non-alcoholic mom goes to a restaurant and orders a two-thirds pint, as you said. She wouldn't care. Like, she's going to order one anyway. There's going to be less sales. But an alcoholic sitting down, I'm just going to order more of them. Like, it doesn't mitigate anything. Yeah, and to the normal drinker, chances are they're going to leave a third of their pint there. You know? Like, how many times you go to restaurants and you see people? This blows my mind how oh, people do it. I, went, I took Weston for pizza a few weeks ago, and I, I picked picked up on it. Some dude sat was sitting down at the, you can order a bottle of beer. Dude, he drank like a third of it while he was waiting for his stromboli and left it there. And even with all the sobriety time I had, I'm like, what is wrong with that guy? Like, not just that you're wasting the beer, but you're literally throwing away money, too. I'm like, what? It makes no sense. Yeah, the it that's something that's always fascinated me. If there's any normies listening right now that would do that, Please send us a comment and an explanation of like, how, yeah, I'd be curious why. to know like what goes on in your head because you know I always go to what is the what is the purpose of drinking alcohol? The purpose of drinking alcohol is to elicit some sort of effect, right? Yeah, I mean, I thought that's you know. Oh, I know. <laughs> so when people order a beer and drink a third of it, you're not getting any effect. So at that point, why not just order a water and save the money or a diet soda or a lemonade or an iced tea? Like if you're going to drink alcohol, drink the alcohol. You know what? I'm, it actually pisses me off, Ben. I see you getting mad. Like if you're going to, if you're going to drink, drink, drink the beer, drink the whole thing. Cause there's people like me that's sitting at the table right next to you wondering, what the hell's wrong with you? I'm just kidding. I'm being facetious at this point, but kind of. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of translates to remember a couple of weeks ago, we answered that question. People are like, if someone has a drug of choice, why do they move to something else when they're trying to be clean? Right. It's like trying different methods to, to your point. The, the purpose is, as I see it, is to, elicit an effect like i'm looking for some sort of effect they they go hand in hand whether you're trying to reduce the amount of the your favorite substance or trying something else it doesn't matter you want you want to get outside of yourself yeah and you never know maybe the person that is drinking the third of the beer is like trying to um reduce maybe they have a problem and they're like i'm gonna see if i can just drink a third of this beer and leave and not finish it. I would never do that, but maybe there's people out there that do. Did you consistently drink mostly the same things or yeah. did you change brands all the time? No, I, I drank, I drank. Your phone's on. My phone is on. Why is my phone on? Oh, that was weird. Um, no, I drank consistently all the same. I mean, so my my drinks of choice were basically Budweiser, Bud Light. I would drink Coors Light if that was the only thing that was there. I, w- I mean, I would drink anything. So as long as it wasn't hand sanitizer or, or vanilla extract. I never went that low. Or mouthwash. But I was beer and whiskey. Jim Beam. Red Stag. Um, Jack Daniels. Stuff like that, you know? I was never into, like, the craft beers, micro brews, all that. They taste like shit, and they're way too expensive. 
I didn't understand that either because I was thinking about that. So when Yard House opened up here back before, way before I got so, what was it, 20 years ago probably? When you got sober? No, no, no. When I was drinking and I lived here. Oh, Yard yeah. House at Gardens Downtown. You know how Yard House has, what, 140 beers on tap or something? Yeah, something like that. Well, they give you these trays, of like a sampler. Like, what's the point? By the time you're done with, like, your fourth or fifth one, it doesn't matter what it tastes like. No. Like, to say you're going for a tasting, like, dude, I'm just slamming them anyway by that point. Yeah, like, oh, this has cedar notes. I guess... <laughs> <laughs> I guess you feel I would feel sophisticated. Yeah, like well, let me get my my sampler of micro brews, and I mean I don't know. It's I, it's silly. I do my sampler with my high class cocaine. Yeah, and don't do the crack till I leave the nice restaurant. Yeah, and and give me a, a pokey bowl, please, <laughs> or some seared ahi tuna. There it is. Like no, I was Budweiser with you know, give me an order. Uh, you know 15 chicken hot wings. chicken wings yep. and some mozzarella sticks you know that Dude. was my go-to you got that written all over you mozzarella sticks dude, are, you, are you like you're, saying you're i'm fat or? no i'm saying you're dude you're backwoods pennsylvania yeah budweiser wings and mozzarella sticks it's you can't find wings down here like you do up there you just can't there's i have yet to find chicken wings like you do up north that's that's not true. Do you have a suggestion? Yeah, there's plenty of places with good like wings, where, dude. Now I'm drawing a blank. I'll... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll let you stew on that. Thirsty turtle. No, terrible. The wing is good. The sauce is not good. What? No, their hot sauce. It's like sweet, sweet and dude, spicy. Famous for their sauce. Well, they shouldn't be. They are. Well, and it's great. No. Uh, Duffy's is okay. No, see, dude, you the uh, remember okay. Teddy's Wing Shack? It was right here. Yeah, with the green ranch. Yeah, they're no longer. They're they're done. Anyway, I remember the time I went to Teddy's with you. This is funny. There was three of us, and Tom ordered like 180 wings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had just started working together. Yeah, I don't think we ate them all either. No way, dude. Yeah, I was like, why do you need so many? All right, so. Getting into our Facebook group, if you don't know by now, go into the Sobriety Network. It's a Facebook group that we put together. Myself, Ben, and Tambini were the moderators, but um, it's for anybody, absolutely anybody that uh, you know has been affected by addiction in any capacity or alcoholism, whether it's you, yourself, a loved one, it doesn't matter. Go there, and we're really trying to build it up. And uh, it's doing pretty well. I think people are starting to interact you know, a lot. Um, but there was something that was posted uh, today, and I just want to read this, Ben, and you tell me your thoughts. No one achieves sobriety unless they truly desire it. No amount of pleading, shaming, reasoning, emotional appeal can make it happen. The decision to get sober comes from one place, their own realization that it's time to change. And our boy Eric Sheets commented on it and oh, said I know. exactly. I gave it a thumbs up. Did you? I did. Yeah, let me. I I did too this morning. Actually, no, I didn't. But somebody did on my behalf. That was probably me. <laughs> okay. So, what do you think of that? No one achieves sobriety unless they truly desire it. Just that part there. I'm going to nitpick here. Are you ready? Yeah. So am I. So unless they truly desire it, if you're a real alcoholic and drug addict. One of the things that the big book talks about, it's a six legs of alcoholism in chapter two. It talks about the desire to be sober is not enough. Just because I want it, because I can tell you from my own experience, I desperately wanted to be sober for what, seven and a half, eight years probably before I did, like desperately wanted it. I had the desire and was unable to achieve that for over seven years. And there, there's that saying, there's that old cliche saying, it's not for people who want it. It's not for people who need it. It's for people who live it. I'm nitpicking. I see, you know, I don't want to come at this black and white because yes, you do have to want it. But that in itself is not enough. 
Yeah. You've really got to buckle down and do the work. I, I mean, I want to um, be jacked like you, Ben. I do. I want to be jacked too, Tom, because now I got muscle dysmorphia. <laughs> That's a completely separate issue. <laughs> There's a lot of things in this world that I want. I want to be a millionaire, and I'm not. Hopefully, I will be one day. Hopefully, we will be. You know, if you guys can make donations to the podcast, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, if I were to nitpick this in any capacity, here's what I would say. And this is, I'm talking more to the families. No one achieves sobriety unless they, and they is italicized, truly desire it. No amount of pleading, shaming, reasoning, emotional appeal can make it happen. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. The decision to get sober comes from one place, their own realization that it's time to change. Okay, so based off of that, how many conversations have we had with parents, loved ones, spouses that say they're just not ready? They, they don't want it. So why would I even bother having the conversation? Or... Why should we pay X amount of dollars for them to go to treatment if we know that they don't want it? Well, I'll tell you why. Because most people are scared. They may seem on the outside that they don't that they don't want it, but if we had the capabilities of like if I were to imagine this Ben We go and do an intervention. Somebody calls us and they say, hey, we need you to fly to wherever to perform an intervention. And we had the capabilities, and maybe we can do this through AI. We wheel in a TV or we take an iPad in. And let's just pretend the person's name is Frank. Frank's a 24-year-old male, alcohol, cocaine, unemployed, Lives at home with his parents, really doesn't do much, doesn't got much going on. Has a college degree in finance, um, but is drinking and doing blow all day long. And parents, he's living at parents' house because he doesn't, they don't, you know, they're parents. They're like, well, we'd rather him live here. And we were to take this iPad in and say, Frank, look, through chat GPT and AI, this is what your life's going to look like. Five months from now, one year from now, three years from now, five years from now, 20 years from now. And that life portrays something that they can't even imagine. Do you think that person would at that point at least consider that sobriety is something worth giving a shot? Yeah. And yes. And and we do see this where... People don't necessarily want to get help, like you're saying, but I'm just going to throw it out there. It's it's not a loss, because that's what I was hearing you communicate, that like families are like, why should I do this if they're not ready now? You never know when somebody's going to get ready, and a lot of times being ready has to do with the people that you're... You always bring up community, Tom. I'll give you this one. All of a sudden, they find themselves in a community of people that inspire them. So let's just think about this very simply put. When I'm shooting heroin, dude, I'm surrounding myself with nothing but people that shoot heroin. Those are my people. This is my norm. All of a sudden you quote unquote, make me go to treatment and I'm surrounded by people that are trying to get sober. It's, it starts to, to look like, Hey, maybe, maybe I want to jump in on this too. We have two cases right now. In our care that that I can say, one, basically op- openly stated, like, as soon as I got this court stuff off of my back, I'm out of here. And we're like, okay, whatever, dude. Just do what you got to do. Follow the rules while you're here. The funny thing is, is it's come up in our staff meeting in the last couple of weeks where now this individual, we're sitting back and we're saying, he was saying that? But if you look at his action now, He's acting like he actually wants this, and it's not just about court. And we have another young guy here, too, who we could pretty easily say he was more coerced into being here, correct? Very young guy. Begin with a J? Yes. Okay. And he's here, and 
all of a sudden starting to act different. It's the people in the community that he's surrounded by. He's stuck with people 24 hours a day that are doing what we're doing. Yeah. It, and it, it's hard not to follow that crowd. Like if you're literally surrounded by people doing this, you're going to be indoctrinated in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. So even just the exposure, it's not a waste of time. We've gone over that a million times. I will say this, and I want I want your take on this. There are – we've sat down in interventions of families, and we've walked out of there saying, yeah, he's not ready. Don't do this. But those are few and far between. Yeah, it depends on the circumstances. It depends on, um, you know, what – what what the situation is a lot of times though if you're able to look at somebody's situation from an over like a from a from a 30,000 foot view nine times out of ten the people aren't ready is because they're not in a position to have to be ready what does that look like well they have a roof over their head Mm. they have food on the table they have no responsibilities. They don't have to be ready because they haven't been put in a position to need to be ready. The people that have responsibilities, I don't know, let's just take a, you know, a married couple. Dad's an alcoholic, wife is completely fed up, they have two, maybe three kids that are young. My situation. I'm 40 years old. I have three kids. And I'm, I'm a raging drunk. There's a lot on the line. My wife told me, she said, Tom, I'm, I'm just role playing here. If you don't go get help, I'm leaving and I'm taking the kids. My employer came to me and said, Tom, if you don't go get help, guess what? You're not going to have a job. Tom, guess what? If you don't go get help, you're not going to have a roof over your head. You're not going to have a car to drive. Maybe the court systems get involved in some capacity. One of the best things that ever happened to me was get my DUI and get fired from my job and get thrown out of my house because I was backed up against the wall. That was all within a week too, right? Three weeks. Three weeks. So I was in a position to have to make a change. And then I became ready. Even though I wasn't even quote unquote ready, I didn't want to stop drinking. I just wanted to, well, I didn't want to, but I was told You got to go to treatment. So I went. This is the issue that I have with this. I didn't at that very moment want to be clean. I didn't want to be sober. I just didn't want to lose everything. And through the process is when things started to really unfold for me. And that's when I was surrounded by people that were doing the deal. And I quickly started to realize, okay, there's something to this. So, but going back to the iPad analogy. If I'm holding this iPad in front of somebody and say, okay, how do you do this, Frank? He's not going to know. He's not going to have a clue how to get to, you know, let's just use Frank's example. He's college educated, has a degree in finance, and he, he dresses well. He presents well. He's a good person, speaks well. He's employable. But he's a raging drunk cocaine head. In five months, legit, if he did everything that we asked him to do, in five months, he could have five months sober, he could be living in sober living, he could have a car, he could be paying his bills, and he could be working at some sort of financial firm, right? Mm -hmm. That's legit. We've seen it happen. But he doesn't have a clue how to get there because all he knows is alcohol and cocaine, and that's where he's comfortable. So he's not going to go outside of his comfort level to achieve something that he doesn't even know the steps to get there. So he's not nine times out of 10 people aren't ready because they don't know how they don't know the process. They need somebody to come alongside them and say, look, even though right now you're not ready, we know how to get you there. And through the process, you will become ready and you'll start to see what this is about and then they organically fall in line. I'm glad you brought that up because it's funny. I was, uh, this is something that I have to be careful with because, you know, we take these phone calls 
And I had a guy the other night give me a call drinking a bottle a bottle a day, you know, and he's and I'm like, have you been to treatment before? He said yes, once. But me, I've been doing this for so long and I'm so used to it that I just kind of I have to be careful not to make the assumption to your point that people know how to go about this. I'm like, well, this is simple. And they're like, it is? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, let's just do X, Y. Oh, I didn't know it was that easy. I'm like, dude, yeah. All, all, all you had to do is pick up the phone and call and let somebody guide you through this. He didn't realize how simple the, the process could be. And sometimes I take that for granted. Like people just don't realize. And I hear that all the time too, even with parents and loved ones. They'll say, we didn't know anything like this even existed. And I have to remember that. How would they? You know, I, what I take for granted. So my kind of part of my point is, in any of this, it's so important to get like people with experience and professionals involved because we know how to navigate these. You know, I asked Tom a second ago, like, like what about the situations where we sit down with people and we do tell the family, yeah, they're not ready or vice versa. We've been doing it for so long and worked with literally thousands of people. Let us do that. You know, like let us decipher best course of action because we've worked with so many people at this point. It's second nature to us. Yeah. You can't assume that somebody's not ready if they're like at home and they, they don't have responsibilities and stuff, you know? Well, what the reading's saying, if I had to sum it up simply, if you feel like they don't have a reason to get sober, give them a reason. Yeah. Leverage points. Leverage points. Exactly. You, you got the ace in your pocket and you don't even know it. A lot of times the families are holding this ace. Yeah. And they, they just don't even know it's in their pocket, dude. And I could tell you, to the readings point, give them a reason. And one of those reasons ain't going to be begging them. Right. Which is what that said. Yeah. In the, in the, um, what did it say? Plead and beg or something. It said no amount of pleading, shaming, reasoning, emotional appeal can make it happen. I agree with that. Yeah. Well, they have to be completely, they have to feel like alcohol defeated them. There's a, there's a line in the big book. And I brought this up before where, it says alcohol is the great persuader. Drugs are the great persuader. The substance is what persuaded them to want to get help. Not another human being. Like they have to have the, the what does it say? Something about recognizing or the realization that like the, the gig is up. Yeah. You know, we can help point this stuff. Like what we do is we point out to them why the drugs and alcohol aren't working for them anymore. It's not us saying, hey, you need to do this so you can have a better life. I'm like, what? But if you start pointing out to me through the methods that we utilize that come second nature to us, like, hey, dude, don't you realize this isn't working and here's why? Let me point it out to you. And they're like, oh, crap. I'm not telling them, oh, you're going to go have a better life. I'm, I'm pointing out to them, you're getting your ass kicked by this drug. And you don't even see it. And that we had our ass kicked by these drugs. Mm -hmm. And we figured out a way to not get our ass kicked by it anymore. And that in and of itself goes a long way. Because when parents and spouses and loved ones try and have these conversations and plead and shame and try and guilt people, nine times out of ten, they're looking at you thinking, you don't even have a clue. You don't know what I'm going through, you know? Yeah. I can't relate to you. You're you're wasting your breath. Yeah. That's why you have to find the leverage points, okay? And I'm not saying that you can't, like, you can, there's certain ways to approach these conversations, and I'm not saying right out of the gate you have to threaten everything that, you know, all, the, all these leverage points. You don't have to right out of the gate say, I'm kicking you out of the house or I'm taking the kids or whatever. There's a process to this, but in the end, that's ultimately, if we have to get to that point, we go to that point. So exactly. Well, that was fun, Ben. Anything else? No. Any no. final thoughts? There was probably a couple more things in there that I could nitpick, but 
Well, that's good for today. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, that is it for this episode of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us, info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see you all later.